it is um, absolutely hard to believe that the last time I sat down with you, we were in the governor's mansion in South Carolina. Now we're here in New York City at the United Nations. Um, was this first year what you thought it would be? I mean, there was no way to predict this first year. There really wasn't because it was moving the family. It was changing jobs. It was going from domestic policy to foreign policy. So there was just no way to really know what I was getting into. But we've tried to do the best we can and really defend the United States and talk about peace and security and get everyone to know the value of the United Nations. And so I think that um, it's been a fun year. It really has been. Um, because we got a chance to sit in yesterday in the Security Council meeting, it was fascinating. And one of the first things you said is that you were frustrated that so much of the focus is on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And there's other threats to the United States that you would in the globe that you would like to be talking about. Um, and I was taken aback almost at the Israeli prime minister or the Israeli ambassador's words that Iran grows stronger and more powerful and more dangerous. And he said, "Yes, their first target is Israel, but the next target is the world." Iran is a very strong threat, and it's one that doesn't get talked about enough, which is why we constantly bring it up. Because you know, aside from the Iran nuclear deal, which everyone likes to talk about. The other side of it is there are UN resolutions that say they can't do ballistic missile testing, and they are. They can't support terrorism, and they are. You know, they can't continue to do um, weapons sales, and they are. I mean, so they're violating every rule under the UN resolution, but the reason that the international community doesn't want to talk about it is they're fearful that they will get out of the nuclear deal. There's no way they're getting out of the nuclear deal. That was one of the best deals ever. They got billions of dollars, and basically can violate the resolutions at the same time. So we're going to continue to be loud about that. That's the sleeping giant that we all need to be careful of. Well, because you are kind of leading the charge on this, how do you corral your other Security Council ambassadors into making this their focus as well? We continue to talk about it. But like Monday, I'll be going to D.C. and taking the Security Council with me to look at all of the missiles that we have unmasked to let them see exactly what w went into Yemen, that these were Iranian missiles, and it shows the markings on them. You can't deny the evidence. And so we'll take them, we'll show them the proof, and then we'll continue to talk about it and see what we need to do to really come down on those violations that they're having. All right, another thing I want to talk with you about, you recently took a trip to Afghanistan. Okay. Um, we know, of course, our South Carolina viewers know your husband spent a year deployed there, and we actually have a, several units um, from McIntyre Air National Guard Base that are deployed in Afghanistan right now. Um, when you were there, you said you felt that President Trump's strategy was working without giving away too much. What is the strategy in Afghanistan and how long can we still expect our South Carolina troops to be going there? First of all, God bless those men and women and God bless their families because Afghanistan's a tough place. And you look at everything there and you say, okay, are we ever going to be done? The first thing we said was, let's don't put a timeline on it. Let's put measurables on it. What does it take to make sure that Afghanistan no longer harbors terrorism? To see that it's working, you now see that the government is moving. Um, the status of women is changing. ISIS is starting to move out. The, the Taliban is um, starting to recede. Once the, the president came out with his Afghanistan policy, the Taliban realized they had to start to come to the table and start talking. And we're starting to see all of that come together. But to see the government really working with the people and trying to see that happen, they, re they got rid of all of their um, retirement level. And so now generals don't retire at 72, they retire at 60. So they took away 70 high-ranking generals because of so much corruption in their military. Wow. They got rid of 4,000 of the Afghan troops that they that were higher aged. Half of the cabinet is now um, at the average age is 40. So it's a younger group that's coming into Afghanistan that's really investing time and effort into making sure that it's a place where they want to raise their families and do well. And our troops are right there beside them. Okay. Um, uh, the biggest question, of course, you know, as a journalist, I get to hear um, what issues people are aware of and what issues people aren't aware of. For the first time, I would say the general public, especially in South Carolina, we are afraid of a war with North Korea.
Um, Senator Lindsey Graham sat down with WLTX earlier this week and said, if things don't change, we very well could be um, in a war with North Korea. They continue testing missiles. The missiles keep going farther. Um, what, as uh, the United Nations, I mean, this is a problem that you guys have to tackle and look at daily. What's, what's happening? Well, I mean, North Korea is a very strong threat. It's something that we watch daily. Um, we don't know what Kim's going to do. Um, he's not, his actions are a little bit all over the place. And so watching what he's doing every day is something that's um, a concern to us because we're seeing the fact that they're continuing to do ballistic missile testing. We're seeing that they're starting to do intercontinental ballistic missiles, which is a real concern because that can reach to the United States. But more importantly, we see how advanced it is now. And they continue to say death to America. They continue to threaten us. And when you look at all of that, we have to take it seriously. This year alone, we passed three of the strongest resolutions um, passed on any country for North Korea. We have basically cut off 90% of their trade. We've cut off 30% of their oil. We no longer allow them to have a guest worker program where they send their people out to work and bring the money back to the government because every dollar that goes to the government doesn't feed the North Korean people. It goes towards the nuclear program. And so we're trying to cut off as much cash as we can to slow down the process until we can get some sort of solution here. But it's, it's not the best of situations, but the United States is on it and we are watching it and we won't let up. I mean, that's the reason you're seeing us be so strong on North Korea. Do you feel like the Twitter interactions between President Trump are escalating or de-escalating the situation? Look, I mean, I think that there's a lot of what the president tries to do on Twitter is to remind Kim exactly what the U.S. can do. If they threaten the United States, I mean, many people will be killed. That's just because the U.S., when they retaliate, there's no way North Korea can win. So making sure that we remind them of that when they start saying death to the United States, when they start threatening us, letting them know how we can threaten them back is something that is important. He does it in his own way, but it's all about communicating strength of the United States and the fact that we're not going to sit there and take this quietly. If you even so much get anywhere near the United States or our allies, we will react. All right, let me ask you this, because I know we've got a lot of our South Carolina viewers excited to talk with you today, and you and I both are from military families. Um, Osan and Kunsan, um, almost all of our F-16 community, all of our Air Force community does two years minimum in Osan or Kunsan. Is it still safe for the families to go with their airmen? So usually we don't have families go if it's not safe. Okay. And there are certain countries where we don't allow family members to go in just for that reason. So yes, I mean, you know, if it ever gets to that point, we pull the families out. That's the first thing we do if it's not that safe. And we haven't done that yet. No, we have not. Okay. Um, I asked um, the WLTX viewers for the last week what they want me to talk to you about. And resounding, well, there's a couple about uh, uh, your favorite things you're missing about South Carolina, but we'll get to that <laughs> in a yes. second. But everybody wants to know, you know, President Trump has had such a high turnover rate in his first year in office. You've stayed steady. How were you able to work with him so well? I think because when I was governor, I knew the importance of my cabinet, I knew what I expected of them, and I wanted them to do their job and do it right for the people of South Carolina. And so I know what the president wants. And so I really just stay very focused on my job, making sure we're communicating with the American public on what the United Nations does, focus on negotiations that will move the ball for the United States, and make sure that we're bringing peace and security. At the end of the day, that's my focus, is peace and security around the world. Because if we have um, safety outside of the United States, we'll have safety here. And so it's something that's very, very important, but that's really the biggest focus of what I try and do. And I think he just lets me do my job. And I'm so thankful that he is supportive because he really lets me do whatever I think is best. Tell me something, um, you and I were chatting yesterday, and tell me something that you feel like the American people don't necessarily know about President Trump and his passion for that he, That he's very knowledgeable on the issues, that he knows a lot, that his gut instinct um, is right. His delivery may cause people heartburn, but at the end of the day, he listens to his advisors. He listens to his cabinet. He asks us what we think about things. He truly deliberates before he does something. So um, 
that's welcoming for me because I know that it's not just being told what to do, it's being part of the process where we can give feedback. And, and so I value that, it's really been helpful. Um, do you feel like the peace of the world is in your hands and when it comes to North Korea right now, are you afraid? Is it time for us as Americans to be afraid right now? No, we are never to be afraid. I mean, that's the one thing is we are the United States. We have the best military in the world. We have the best intelligence in the world. We know exactly what's happening and we're on it. And that's what people should know is that everyone knows where the threats are we're already looking at that, taking care of it, and the president will not let up. He truly believes that, that America first is safety first. And so protecting civilians, that's the biggest um, point that this administration has worked on, and so no need to be fearful. All right, the last time I sat with you, or at least a few times ago, we were talking about what is next for Nikki Haley. And we have called you representative, we have called you Governor Haley, we are now calling you Ambassador Haley. Is there a Vice President or President Haley in our future? I never, you couldn't have paid me enough to, for me to think that I would ever be here in New York doing this job. I would never have seen it um, coming. So what I have always tried to do is do my job, make the people that I serve proud, and whatever happens next just comes. And it's been surprising and it's been fun. Um, but you know, at some point, I do have to go to being normal and you know, get back to uh, public service is such a big part of Michael and my life. But you know, we do have to start to say, okay, when do we kind of- Take a breath. Yes, settle down. So, but you know, I'm gonna continue doing the best job I can while I can. And then when it's time to move on, I will. Let me ask you this. Um, obviously, all of our viewers with uh, Emanuel AME Church shooting um, went through a time where it could have pulled us all apart in South Carolina. Instead, we came together. Um, how has that made you look at sort of the divisiveness in the country right now and wish that we could put one thought onto the others? When situations like that happen or tragedies happen, it's so fragile. And I remember all I wanted was to just protect and to take care of everyone. So trying to keep the outside forces from coming in was a huge part of it, trying to take care of the families because that kind of healing doesn't happen overnight, but trying to protect the people. I mean, they just saw something horrific that they couldn't get over. And so a lot of what we need to remind each other is we all have the same fears. We all have the same thoughts. We all, um, love and, and, and take care of our families. But when someone hurts, we all need to understand that pain and we need to listen to that pain and we really need to reach out and let them know they're loved. And I will forever be thankful to the people of South Carolina that really wrapped their arms around those families and wrapped their arms around each other so that nothing would divide us. We need to do more of that. I mean, the political parties and how divided they are, there's no help I mean, that's not helping the situation, it's hurting the situation. Mm -hmm. Any sort of divide in the country is never gonna be good. We're our best and our strongest when we're unified. Mm -hmm. All right, I know I'm almost out of time, but I just wanna ask you one more thing. What do you miss about South Carolina? Oh, what don't I miss about <laughs> South Carolina? I miss the grass and the trees. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's amazing how we take that for granted, but the beauty of South Carolina, I miss football season. Um, and cheering on my t tigers in person. Um, I miss the Heritage Golf Tournament. You know, that was always such a great a thing. And I just, I miss the, the people of South Carolina, I think more than anything. I mean, you really, when you step away from the state, you realize how blessed we are to be South Carolinians. And that's where I'm going back. That's where our family's going back, that's home. Um, but I, I miss it every day. We still go back for spring break and summer vacations and, all of that, and so I try and you know always have a reason to go back to South Carolina, but we love it, and it's just such an amazing state, and it will always be a great day in South Carolina. <laughs> that is so true. All right.